scripture that I'm going to be teaching from is Revelation 21. But unlike when, how we usually do it, where we read the scripture at the beginning, I'm going to wait till the very end to read the scripture. And that might seem odd to you. But what I want to do is I want to paint a picture leading up to that. I want to paint a picture of a thread that runs all throughout Scripture till we get to the end of Revelation. Because as you know, if you've been with us these last few months, we've been studying the book of Revelation. And while it might seem odd to preach and teach out of Revelation on Christmas Eve, I think you'll see the point. And the basis and the picture that I want to paint that will lead us to our text in Revelation 21 really comes from that call to worship. The call to worship that John read at the beginning of the service. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so we see two names for Jesus given in that text. He's called Jesus because he's going to save them from their sins. But this was written that he would be called Emmanuel, God with us. And so let's hold that thought for a second. Because before we get into that, I'd like to, to say, I know there's a lot of visitors here tonight and different things bring people to church on Christmas Eve. And so maybe you're here with family or maybe you just know it's Christmas and you ought to come to church. But maybe you don't really believe this Christmas story. Maybe it's just a quaint story that we're reading. And so I want to address that for a second here. I'd like to ask you to have an open mind, <laughs> is what I'd like to ask. Just, just for tonight, if you are skeptical about this story, if you are skeptical that Jesus Christ is actually God, I'd like you to consider a few things. As I said, we've been studying Revelation here for the last few months and the book of Revelation opens, and the picture that we painted, or one of the main themes that we discussed, was that there is more than meets the eye. And in particular, these last few weeks, we've talked about that. We've talked about having childlike wonder and how we lose that. We've talked about having imagination and a sense of awe. And maybe that fairy tales really do come true. Of course, I'm not talking about fairy tales in the sense of fake stories coming true. But those fairy tales, maybe they actually go back to a more ancient story. Actually based on a story that is hard-coded into creation. And it informs very much our fears and our desires. And it's a story that drives us. Maybe we don't even read fairy tales anymore. I mean, maybe that's something of the past. But what about superhero movies? All you have to do is look at what Hollywood is producing, movie after movie in the Avengers series or these Star Wars movies. There is just something that longs, that in our hearts, that makes us long for a savior, for a hero, for a champion, somebody who will save the world, forget the world, save the universe. They're spending billions of dollars cranking these movies out because... That's what people want to see. So for a moment, consider, why do we love those stories? Could it be perhaps that we long for a savior? But more than that, can you imagine we actually get to know the savior? All these superhero movies or whatever heroes you've had growing up, how much more special was it if you actually got to meet them? If you got to say, I know that person, or even better yet, that person's my friend. So if you don't believe in this God that we celebrate today, just for a moment, dispel your unbelief and consider why these longings are there. And can it be true that there is a Savior and that we can know him? And so as we work our way to that sermon text, Revelation 21, and build an argument to it, I want to ask you, what do you say then this book is about? Is it just a rule book? Ways to behave? Is God just some disinterested entity in the sky that set things in motion and created rules for us to follow and this is 
page after page of rule? Is it contradictory? Does the Old Testament show a God of wrath and the New Testament a God of love? And how do we reconcile the two? And maybe you're, you're a skeptic in this regard for that reason. Our text today, Revelation 21, paints a completely different picture. It links back to the Old Testament and brings it forward into the New Testament through the person of Jesus Christ into eternity future. This is the end of the story. Or is it the beginning of the story? Or is it the beginning of the end of the story? See, to me, all of the Bible coalesces, all Christianity hinges on, all of the stories in the Bible link to this statement. It's not a statement of God's being or who God is. All of that is of foundational, fundamental importance. Yes, God is holy, God is just, God is loving. We will plumb the depths of eternity trying to figure those things out and learning about him in that. But all of that cannot happen without this truth. The common thread that runs throughout all of Scripture from start to finish that connects Old Testament and New Testament, it's God's purpose in creation, is summed up in the statement, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's from Isaiah, our Call to worship, quoted it in Matthew. God with us. That's what it means. I'm saying this is the thread that connects everything in the Bible. This idea is completely foreign to any other world religion. Those are just rule books and just ethical systems, how to be good and not be bad. This is different. God with us. This is a relationship. The Bible starts out and ends with the idea that God desires to live with his people. Relationship. And we see this in the very first chapter of the Bible when God creates. And what's the pinnacle of that creation? Well, it says he created man and woman in his image. And then he rests. And so many people say that the pinnacle of God's creation is his creating man. Mankind, man and woman. But see, that's to miss the point. That's not the pinnacle of the creation. The creation is God, the pinnacle of God's creation is him dwelling with his people. That's what chapters 2 and chapters 3 in Genesis show. And so God's in the, the garden and he's like raising his child Adam. Bringing animals to him and teaching him about the animals. And Adam gets to name the animals. Don't we do this with our kids? I remember opening books with animals in it and teaching them to each of my kids and what do they say and what are their names. You have to do that out of books in the city of Florida or South Florida. Here, I guess you just go over to one of the farms, the Owen farm maybe, and you let them see the actual animals. But God is dwelling with his children. He's teaching them. He's walking in the cool of the garden with his children, but then in chapter 3, they're hiding. Something's wrong in the relationship. He says, where are you? He knows where they are. The point is they're not with him. The point of the Bible. And so there is a fall. They sin. They reject his covenant with him. But we were given a promise that we looked at last week. That the seed of the woman would crush the seed of the serpent and make all things right and new again. That there would once again be restored relationship. But the problem is for now, there's a separation. Angels are placed at the garden and they're cast out of the garden. God no longer with his people, but yet he wants to be with his people. He longs for the day when they want to be with him. I've counseled many parents who know the torment of having rebellious adult children that cannot live in their homes anymore due to addiction to drugs or theft or violent outbursts or just a lifestyle that is unbecoming of living in their home, and it breaks their heart, but they cannot dwell in unity in their parents' homes anymore. That's what happens at the fall. But God doesn't want to be separated from his children. So the whole Bible, that common thread, is God restoring that relationship and foreshadowing how it will be restored. The next book, the Exodus, 40 chapters. 
When you're in seminary, they, they tell you you have to be able to outline every book of the Bible. So you look for simple ways to do that. So how do you outline 40 chapters of Exodus? It's very simple in two parts. The first part, God delivers his people. The second part, God sets up to dwell with his people. God delivers his people. God dwells with his people. And you know what's right between them? The marriage covenant. You can look that up in Exodus chapter 20. In Leviticus, which is a, such a law-heavy book, all these rules, it says this, such grace, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. I, will, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be slaves. People don't like Leviticus, so many hard laws, yet grace and gospel. Still the people rejected God. They wanted a king, but he was to be their king. And so he gives them a king, and they build him a temple. And he moves into the temple the same way he moved into the tabernacle. See, back in the Exodus, when he was dwelling with his people, they set up a tent that he would dwell in. Now they have a temple that he would dwell in. But the kings and the prophets reject him. Once again, not the prophets, sorry. The priests and the people reject him. So God wonders what to do. It's now wondering what to do. It's always been the plan. But he's showing his people what he will do. See, he's not going to start over. He's already done that twice through Noah, through Abraham. It's not that God failed. He's teaching his children that in order to, for them to be restored to him, he's going to have to do it because we will constantly reject him. And so in the prophets, Ezekiel 36, I will take you from the nations and gather you from the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall dwell in the land that I give your fathers. Once again, God dwelling with his people. Zechariah, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst. What's my point? The whole Old Testament is showing that God wants to dwell with his people. So you get to John chapter 1, that great opening section of John, which brings us back to the creation. How does Genesis 1 begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, there was nothing that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's reflecting back to creation where God speaks and creates light. And here Jesus Christ is the light. And then it says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory as the glory of the Son, the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That word for dwelt is a made-up word that John made up. He, he makes a verb out of a noun. The noun is tabernacle. And the word became flesh and tabernacled or tented among us. He's bringing us back to the Exodus when God was dwelling with his people. What was the outline to Exodus? Do you remember? God delivers his people and God dwells with his people. And so if Jesus Christ is going to dwell with his people, what's he going to have to do? He's going to have to deliver them. It's the Exodus paradigm. This is why Matthew says, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This was written that his name would be Emmanuel, God with us. If his name was supposed to be Emmanuel, God with us, why is the angel telling Joseph to name this baby Jesus? Because in order for God to dwell with his people, he needs to deliver his people. That's what you see. That's why the two names. Jesus is the name for Joshua, or Yeshua. It means the God who saves. And as we've been saying, Emmanuel is God with us. J Jesus Christ is the God who saves so that he can be the God who is with us. That's the Christmas message. That's why Christ took flesh, the incarnation. Yeshua is Emmanuel. We don't serve a hard God, an ogre God, or a genie in a bottle God. We have a God that wants to be with us. 
Maybe if you don't believe in this God and hopefully it, through this message you're able to see that the Bible isn't as discontinuity, discontinuous as you may think. There is one thread that runs from start to finish. God creates to be with his people and the whole Bible is his work on your behalf to be with you, to dwell with you. Yes, there are commandments. Earlier I called it a marriage covenant. What relationship doesn't have boundaries? If you have a spouse, you expect your spouse not to cheat on you. If you have children, you expect them to behave, to obey you. Even your friends, you expect them to be honest. If not, it breaks the relationship. So God says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other spouses besides me. Children, honor your parents. Don't lie. It's just the marriage covenant. And while us as humans struggle to remain faithful, we can rejoice that our God wants to be with us so much that he sent his son. That's what we celebrate tomorrow, tonight, to reconcile us, to bring us back to him. So Christ takes on flesh and becomes a baby and grows into a man. He comes to us so that we can come to him. He becomes poor so that we can become rich. He gets dirty with our sins so we can be washed clean in his righteousness. He lived a life I failed to live and died the death I deserved to die so that I can dwell with him, so that he can dwell with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the God who saves so that he can be the God with us. He is the God who delivers so that he can dwell with us. And until that day, when he returns, the gospel message is spreading. That's why the two comings. This message has to spread, and we have hope of his advent. This season we celebrate his coming. We have hope of his coming. And we can remember that and rejoice in that, even when it's tough, because we know how the story ends. The story ends how it begins. It ends in the garden. It ends in a marriage. But with redemption accomplished, the common thread is secured. God is with us. Hopefully with that context, I now bring us to Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. Once again, our translators put dwelling. It's the word tabernacle. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He will tabernacle with them, and they will be his people. And God himself, and God himself, will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my child. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, and the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of the Lord gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. If you don't know this God who sent his son to save you and to be with you, why not repent of your sins? Repent of living life your own way. You get to know the hero. You get to know the savior. Believe in Jesus Christ and be saved tonight. And then you could always remember that on Christmas Eve, 
the year 2019 is the day that you came to faith in Jesus Christ, the God who came to save you, the God who came to dwell with you. Yeshua Emmanuel, the God who saves the God with us. Let's pray.